Hello and welcome to chapter 16 where we're going to talk about small business pricing and credit strategies or decisions. Um, I'm going to add my two cents. Uh, a lot of the information that we're going to go over, um, I, uh, I just want to give you some real world examples. So anyway, let's get started. See what the learning objectives are for this course or for this chapter, excuse me. And one of the things that uh, small business owners sometimes don't realize is how critical pricing and credit decisions are uh, to the success of their business. Um, they, they sort of overlook these uh, details uh, as they're starting the business, but they do, they are critical decisions that have to be made uh, before the business is open. And the thing about it is um, most people most entrepreneurs and small business owners are never trained on how to do it. And I really think that the, uh, the experience that I had in retail management over the years when I worked as a manager for JCPenney's, when I was director in, uh, of sales and marketing for uh, a medical equipment uh, chain, and those, those uh, experiences helped uh, – Helped me out tremendously when I opened up my own medical equipment company. Um, when we're pricing, value has to be sort of the center of our uh, thought process. In other words, people are not going to pay any price for our products or services unless they see some type of value in it. So up here I put consumers must perceive value from the products they purchase. Otherwise, they will not buy uh, from you. We all know what price is. And we'll talk about credit as well. Um, so price is important because everything that we sell, obviously, our total revenue comes from volume times the price that we're selling it at. So it's it's very, very important to make sure that we sell uh, or we have our products and services priced at the right level. But it's not very easy. It's not easy to understand what price looks good to the customer. So I'll talk a little bit how you, I mean, it's, it's an imperfect science, but I'll talk a little bit about it in a little bit about how you can uh, come as close as possible to setting the right price. Obviously, we have to cover cost when we price our products. Our products are going to cost us something. If we are selling a tangible product that we possibly bought from a wholesaler, we're going to pay a price to that wholesaler. And so we have to cover that cost of that item. But covering the cost of that item is not enough. Um, basically, if we sold everything for what we, uh, we bought it at, we're not going to make any money. In fact, we're going to lose money because there are operating expenses involved. Lease, uh, leases, salaries, um, utility bills. So we have to be able to recoup our cost of the product, but also we have to be able to uh, recoup some type of uh, amount beyond that cost in order to cover other expenses. And then, of course, we want to make money. So we want to make a profit. Now, I'm not going to go over average pricing uh, in detail, and I won't ask you anything on the quiz about it, because, and you can take a look just so you know what it is, but I can tell you right now that small businesses do not use average pricing in order to price their products. Obviously, we want to make sure that we know what the total cost of the product is and the cost that we're incurring, but most small businesses offer a variety of products. And so average pricing is uh, relatively easy to do if we only sold one product or we only had one service. But still, there are some downfalls or pitfalls to the average pricing uh, model. So here's just an, uh, an example of uh, average pricing and the cost structure of a fi fictional firm. But average pricing overlooks the reality of 
higher average cost at lower sales levels. So the, the problem with average pricing is we don't know how much we're going to sell. So not knowing what the sales volume is sort of throws everything out of whack with average pricing. And so I'm going to tell you right now, in the real world, small business owners and entrepreneurs don't use average pricing. Here's another example. One thing, though, I would want you to get out of this, though, is pricing at less than total cost uh, can be used as a short-term strategy to increase demand. So when we put what we call loss leaders uh, up for sale, sometimes we will sell something that doesn't cover cost just to bring people into our establishment or into our website to browse and hopefully stimulate sales of other products. You'll see it sometimes, uh, not very often, but you will see that strategy used. One thing that's important to understand as an entrepreneur or small business owner is elasticity of demand. Now, I know all of you have probably had uh, your first economics course, and maybe you've had both of them, micro and macro. Elasticity helps us determine pricing. If we have a product that has uh, a very elastic demand, in other words, a small uh, change in price will uh, result in a large change in demand, then we have to be very careful of how we price our products. Because if, if we have a product that has a very uh, elastic demand, we will kill ourselves if we increase the price just a little bit because they will find substitutes and they will go to our competitors. However, we have a product that has inelastic demand. In other words, the demand does not change all that much because of the price. And here in this example, they use milk because people have to have milk, or most people have to have milk. Um, so a change in the price of milk does not uh, proportionately change the uh, demand of milk. So understanding the elasticity of our product. Now, most small business owners are going to have a product that has relatively elastic demand because small business owners aren't going to go into the milk business uh, or open up, well, you might open up a convenience store that uh, sells gasoline. Gasoline is another product that has inelastic demand. But gasoline prices are, uh, that's a whole uh, another ball of wax that we won't get into today. So, Pricing and um, the sustainable competitive advantage of the firm uh, correlate. If we have, well, I'll give you an example of my store. My competitive advantage for West Virginia Discount Medical was I offered low prices. I offered low, the lowest prices that I could uh, based on cost and, how, you know, I had to make a profit. But my prices were my competitive advantage. Now, some uh, firms may use another tactic called prestige pricing. Prestige pricing is used when customers correlate high quality with the price. So a Rolex watch, a Mercedes Benz, a Jaguar, a BMW. People associate those names with a higher price, but they also associate those names with higher quality. So there's demand there. So prestige pricing, uh, when you're using, uh, when you have a product that uses prestige pricing, a lot of times lowering the price will hurt your uh, sales because people will think, well, why is this Mercedes on sale for $19,999, this brand new Mercedes? There must be something wrong with it. So this prestige pricing, um, it varies from market to market, from product to product, but uh, people do associate um, quality with higher priced, with prestige priced products. Um, understanding your products, understanding all, everything that you have to cover as far as operating expenses. So knowing, knowing where 
everything done. And th this goes back to one of the earlier chapters when we talked about the income statement and knowing what operating expenses are versus startup costs and understanding what our our costs are on a monthly basis, we have to know that when we're pricing our products. An another economics uh, subject that is uh, covered in this book that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, though, is the break-even analysis. So I, I know that in uh, at least macro, you talked about break-even analysis and the break-even point. So the break-even point basically is where at a certain sales volume, Sales revenue equals total cost and expenses. So the firm actually covers all of its expenses and has a zero profit. Again, break even, when we're talking about break even points and break even pricing, it's very difficult for a small company to do this because small companies have a variety of products that they sell. So knowing exactly what the break even point is nearly impossible to figure out. However, if you were a manufacturing firm that produced only one item, say you made steel beams, eight foot steel beams, and that's the only thing that you manufactured, you could easily find out what your break even point was because you could calculate all your costs and expenses and uh, you could easily do that. However, in a small business situation, it's nearly impossible to calculate pricing uh, based on break even point. But I do want you to know what break even point is. So remember, uh, make sure you understand the definition and also understand the what is the contribution margin. Okay, so that's basically the difference between the selling price and the unit variable cost and expenses. Okay, so the contribution margin of a of a product is the percent the, the amount that is uh, covering those expenses. Here's the graphs. I'm sure you remember those from macro. Uh, I won't be asking you any questions uh, on break-even graphs for pricing. Markup pricing. Now, markup pricing is a little bit more real world. This is probably, I'm going to say generally, this is the most common uh, strategy for pricing products, putting a markup on it. And I'm going to, uh, here in a few slides, I'm going to give you some a real world explanation of, uh, of what or how uh, markup pricing is used. But markup pricing can be expressed as a percentage of the selling price, or it can be um, um, expressed as a percentage of cost. And usually when you're, when you're first uh, looking at markup, you'll, you'll use the cost version because uh, you know what that cost is. And you don't exactly know what your, uh, what your uh, final price is going to be. But you, you do want to make sure that you know, your markup rate helps cover operating expenses and gives you the desired level of profit. But again, it's very difficult when you're selling, for instance, my company, I had thousands of products. It would have been virtually impossible to figure out what one single product, how what even what the contribution margin was going to be. It just would have been nearly impossible. So there's different strategies that we'll talk about. We'll talk about penetration pricing, where we pro where we go into the market with a very low price in hopes in, in hopes to increase market share. Price skimming is when we go into the market um, that is virtually new and we can we can charge a higher price. So when a new technology comes out, it's usually priced at a higher price. We can skim the top and recoup a lot of profit, uh, recoup our cost and make a lot of profit by price skimming. Follow the leader pricing, variable pricing, price lining, and other uh, options that are out there. So penetration pricing I just told you about, uh, where we, uh, we try to increase our market share by going into the, try to penetrate the market with a lower price. Price skimming, when you go into a relatively limited period of time at a very high price. Maybe it's very new, very different, uh, or maybe it's a totally new market. Follow the leader strategy. Variable pricing is where we charge different uh, 
prices for a product based maybe on quantity. So if you, you know if you buy one of these, this is the price. If you buy ten, this is the price. Um, so it, it, one product has different prices at different levels. And you can see the different other, some of the other different pricing strategies. Making sure that when we are pricing that we're not breaking any federal laws, federal or local laws uh, regarding pricing. Okay, so according to Jim, uh, myself, here are how most small businesses price their products. First, they consider at least 100% markup on cost. Okay, so if something cost us $20, 100% markup would mean we're going to charge $40. So we, we, use, we sort of use that as a starting point. Okay, most small businesses will use that as a starting point. Say, okay, I'll, I'll double the, my price. You know, if I have this $20 item, I want to get $40 out of it. But that's just a starting point. Then we compare our product or our store to other competitors, other like competitors out there. Do they offer more value or do we offer more value? So if our competitors have this product at $40, but our product is maybe a little bit better, higher quality. We might go above 40. However, if our competitors have that similar product at $40 and we don't offer as much value, maybe they offer free delivery, maybe their product is a little bit higher quality, then we probably price that product below that $40 mark. So we compare our competitors. And then finally knowing that you must have a profit you select a price that you feel confident is going to stimulate demand. In other words, would I buy this product, and you have to be very objective, but would I, brought, would I buy this product from my store it set at this price? Why wouldn't I go to another, another location or a competitor? Okay, so a lot of it is just gut, and you have to uh, – so what? You have to know your competitors. You have to know the market, and you have to know the customer. If you don't know those three things, you're going to be pricing on a whim, and it's going to be very difficult to, to get a price that's going to work. Obviously, you want to charge the highest price that you can that's not going to affect demand. In other words, people are still going to buy this product at this price, but anything higher, they're not going to, because you want to reap the most profit that you can from your, from your uh, products. Credit. Do we offer credit? And I'm going to breeze through this real quick because obviously we're going to offer credit. And what I mean by that, all small businesses, and I'll, I'll touch this uh, base on this in a minute, but all small businesses have to be able to um, take a major credit card. Customers today, we're going more and more towards a cashless society. So we have to be able to take credit cards. It's just the fact of the matter. There's a few places, very few places, that don't take credit cards and don't only take cash. They only take cash. Uh, I'm thinking of the little restaurant, Macketeers, down on Fairmont Avenue uh, or Locust Avenue, that they don't take credit cards. They only take cash or check. Um, but there's lots of reasons to offer credit. Um, so here's some benefits of credit to buyers and benefits of credit to sellers. Become familiar with those. So there's some factors that affect selling on credit, the type of business, your policies, the competitors, um, customers' ages and income levels. I'm, I'm still telling you, don't worry too much about that because we're really only dealing with 90% of the credit that we're dealing with is going to be major credit cards. So we don't have to worry about that because the customer already has the card. And we're, if, if they use it and it gets approved through our credit card machine, we get paid. Okay? So we don't have to worry about their age and income levels too much. There's consumer credit, which if we granted credit to uh, our customers, and trade credit. Now, some stores have their own credit card. Most small businesses are not. Okay, if you go to Home Depot, you might have a Home Depot credit card, or J.C. Penney's might have a J.C. Penney credit card, Lowe's, a Lowe's credit card. Most small businesses are not going to have consumer credit, but they will take major credit cards. 
Trade credit is where we actually provide, uh, where suppliers provide credit to their customers. Now, I mentioned this in the last chapter, where if you would buy from a wholesaler, they may give you 30 days credit. I'm going to give you an example of where a small business might do that as well. Here's the different types of consumer credit. And again, the major bank credit card is what small businesses are going to be dealing with. Here's an example of trade credit where you get the 210 net 30, which basically means if you pay early. Now, some do this, some don't. Some companies do this, some don't. But if basically what that means, you probably learned this from accounting. Uh, if you pay within 10 days, you get a 2% discount, but the whole amount is due by 30 days. Here's my real-world credit, uh, and you can use this because in small business, I think this is the real world. Small businesses must allow the use of major credit cards. There's just no way, if you're going to succeed and grow, there's no way that you can uh, not allow credit cards. Um, small businesses should never extend private credit to consumers. So in other words, uh, years ago, there'd be mom and pop grocery stores where the family would have a, a credit. And so you could go to the store, get a loaf of bread, and they'd put it on your tab. And then at the end of the month, you go and pay the bill. Those days are long gone. Everyone has access to credit cards today. So we don't extend private credit. How we, however, we would extend private credit to institutions. So if someone is using us as, as a supplier, so let me give you an example. Let's say that you were a clothing store and you sold uh, uniforms. And maybe there's a local company that buys shirts from you every month uh, for their employees. And they, maybe they buy 40 shirts a month. You could extend them private credit and say, okay, they might call and say, hey, we need 10 shirts. Can you send those over? You send them 10 shirts. You give them, you know, and then at the end of the month, you send them a bill. Things of that nature, credit of that nature, is I would advise to, to do that because you can be you can actually create very loyal customers by doing that. Still yet, you should limit the amount that you do that because it is, as you'll see here in a minute, it is very costly to maintain private credit. It, it, it consumes time and money. Evaluating those those folks, those uh, institutions that you extend credit to, billing and collection procedures, all of that is uh, time consuming and an expense for your business. So you want to limit the amount that you do that. And this just talks about the evaluation of credit applicants. Uh, I'm not going to get into that, nor I'll hold you liable for that on a quiz. The traditional five C's of credit being character, capacity, capital collateral conditions, these, uh, these are used by banks. So take a look at those so that you always know what they are. And uh, it's very helpful to, to understand what they mean and how they're evaluated. I'm not going to talk, we all know about credit card data, and, uh, but there's lots of sources of it. An aging schedule just talks about, here's another thing that you have to uh, worry about when you extend private credit is sometimes companies won't pay when they're supposed to pay and those those accounts begin to age so if we have you know if we've got customer one that uh, owes us fifteen fifty thousand dollars and uh, it's only been 15 days then that's probably all right we're probably going to get that money but if you take a look at a customer that owes fifty thousand dollars over 120 days you may not get that money or you only get a portion of it because after as time goes on and it's less and less likely that you're going to be able to collect that those monies for your accounts receivable so uh, you have to keep track of that and you have to bill them and remind them to pay so that's another reason why extending credit depending on your products and services extending private credit is is very tricky so you want to be careful of that I'm not going to talk about billing and collection procedures. That's not uh, any of our concern. There are credit regulations uh, and certain laws that you have to adhere to. And there's your key terms. So I, 
I hope you understand that pricing is very important. There's lots of different strategies to go by. And uh, as a private small business owner, you're going to have to deal with credit, either through major credit cards or through some private credit that you might extend to uh, loyal uh, customer, uh, institutional type customers. Hope you're staying safe. And we have one more chapter to go before the end. So congratulations, you're nearing the end.